Hi, my name is Jonathan Allen, and I teach trombone at the University of Iowa. This is my 10th year teaching there, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to present this virtual presentation on the trombone for the Iowa Bandmasters Association. I wanted to go through some of the trombone basics. Um, some of these things you'll be familiar with, some possibly not. Um, for specific recommendations, uh, I encourage you to check out the handout that should be on this page as well. Um, so. Just for getting started right from the very beginning, I'm sure this is basic for everybody. We're going to start by putting the trombone together, but I wanted to talk about um, some grip issues because trombonists, especially young trombone players, have some can sometimes have some pretty serious grip issues that can lead to hand pain, and I wanted to talk about ways to alleviate that. So first of all, the trombone should go together between the bell and the slide at about 45 degrees is typical. Um, but for young younger trombone players, <coughs> Um, you can make that angle slightly more narrow. What we don't want is that the trombone resting on the head or the neck, um, but making this angle a little tighter than 90 degrees um, can make that more comfortable for the hand. Um, I don't know if this is PC anymore, but I like to teach the pistol grip for the left hand. The fingers wrapping around the slide grip. Um, younger trombone players won't have a valve, but they'll have a bar right here that they can rest their thumb on. And I like the finger to rest across. Um, on smaller trombones, that can typically work. Sometimes you'll have a student who has an even smaller hand. They can bring their finger down like this. So index finger down, or depending on the trombone, sometimes you can actually do split the fingers like uh, Spock here and have two fingers down. That won't work on my horn, but that works for some young trombone students. Um, some trombone students might actually like to rest their thumb along the bottom of the instrument to help hold it upwards rather than wrapping the, the thumb around the, the bar, which would be about right here on a beginning trombone. That might be more comfortable for some. And so they get this effect of holding the trombone up here. The trombone is one of the least ergonomic instruments, so this is a problem. Um, for a lot of young students, if they're holding it in a traditional pistol grip, um, a majority of the weight is actually held by the pinky. This is where a lot of the the grip and the balance comes from. Um, you can't really with the index finger, maybe a little bit from the ring finger. So it's an inherently um, not ergonomic. So what was what the, is important is to teach the trombone young trombone players to make sure that they're holding it um, in one of these ways and holding it correctly. And, and over time, they'll develop the muscle in order to not have pain while they play. Um, sometimes some common issues I see with young players is I see them slouching over like this, which obviously makes it so they can't take a full breath. Um, they'll rest the trombone on the shoulder and the trombone's not designed to go on the shoulder. I think I've, you know, heard some people teach that. That's not the case. It's not designed to rest on the shoulder. Um, for a young student, they might be of the size where they can, but as they get bigger, then they have to bring their faith to the instrument and that will change over time, change where the mouthpiece rests on the face. So we want to sit tall and bring the trombone to your face. If you have a student who has the tendency to kind of come down into it, um, an effective way that I've found to help erase that is for a time, have them bring the trombone over their head and bring it to their face. And they'll find that usually the trombone or the mouthpiece is in a very different location um, than what they did before. They were slouching or hunching over. Next is the right hand grip. Um, I like to teach the spot grip for the right hand. So the thumb goes on the top or towards you on the slide grip. Two fingers up, two fingers down. Some people teach this way, palm down. I like to teach um, with the palm facing me because I want that wrist to be as flexible as possible. The wrist can move this way. I know string players learn to be flexible but for this, this laterally, but I found for myself that um, the palm towards me is the most relaxed, comfortable thing. You want that right elbow about 45 degrees down and, and, and relax. We don't want you know the chicken wings or anything like that. We want it to be nice and comfortable and um, when we start with a, as ergonomic as possible, students have a greater chance for success.
when a new student purchases or rents or leases an instrument from a local music store, it typically comes with a instrument care package. Um, typical things you'll find in there is a cleaning cloth, um, a snake, which has a, a tip like this, which is only used for cleaning the crook or the bottom of the slide. And it'll typically come with slide oil, which will look like your typical trumpet or horn valve oil. Throw this in the garbage. That is, it's not very good. And if you have a partnership with a local store, see if you can encourage them to put something else in there. I like either slide oil mix or my personal preference is the Yamaha trombone slide oil. It is called trombone slide oil or trombone slide lubricant, but it's a much thicker silicon based substance similar to slide oil mix. Um, I find that I can reapply this multiple times without cleaning the slide and still works really well. So for young students, that's probably good. Um, slide mix, you're supposed to clean the slide every time you use it. And I find that young students are probably not going to do that. Um, this will not be included in a care package, but I'll, again, I'll put the link in, in the, um, in the packet with a handout, but this is a, a product that you can buy for not too expensive. It's a slide rod with a terry cloth sleeve. This is made by slide mix. It's about $30. And I would encourage this for students because this thing, you can just take it off and throw it in the, in the washing machine and throw it in the dryer um, rather than using cheesecloth. So this, and it has extra material on the bottom so students are less likely to damage the end of the slide. Um, there are other videos on YouTube that are easily discoverable to, to clean a trombone slide with cheesecloth, um, but this is what I recommend to all of my students. And I would definitely recommend it to young students because it works really well, it's effective, um, it's a little more expensive than a slide rod with cheesecloth, but over time it probably works out to pretty similar if they're cleaning the instrument that is. And I've had this for 20 years and it still works great. If your students have a valve on their instrument, if they're older students that have a valve, um, typically they need two types of lubricant, whether it's a traditional valve or the, whether they have one of the cone shaped axial flow or Thayer valves. Um, Typically, what I like to teach my students is thin on the inside, thick on the outside. So I like Hetman number 11 light rotor oil for the inside, and I like the number 15 ball joint for the outside. And by the outside, I mean just these, these ball joints right here, and I would just lubricate those liberally. I'm not going to lubricate this from the, from the outside that would because it would leak inside. You'd use thin there. So the thick is just these couple moving parts here and maybe up in the springs here. You can't see that right here, these springs. So I'd get in there and lubricate those as well. And I also would take the tuning slide off and lubricate down like that so it while rapidly moving the valve so that the oil can get down into the valve. One of the most common issues I see with trombone players that come to visit me at the University of Iowa or come study is that they often have strange breathing habits. And I think some of that comes from um, not understanding the anatomy, which is fine for a young trombone player. And sometimes it comes from um, things I think that are good natured from previous teachers um, or have good intentions, but might cause some bad habits. So some things I, I have heard from my students that they'll say is um, they were taught to, to like that their teacher wanted to hear them breathe. So they, oh, they, they create extra tension in the throat or sometimes teachers will say, I want to see you breathe. And so they will like raise their shoulders or arch their back, which effectively shrinks your vital lung capacity by compressing the lungs. So um, some effective ways that I've found to, to teach breathing is, well, first of all, of course, it needs to be relaxed. So I think a large relaxed breath rather than take a big breath Big often implies effort, or even if it doesn't imply it, the student will also he often hear in their head that there needs to be uh, a lot of work involved. That's not true. Um, I always tell my students that they already know how to breathe because they're still alive, um, but we pick up the trombone and we, the brain stops working, you know, um, which I'm a trombonist, I get. So um, one way I like to teach is to suck air in through the lips. That takes the emphasis off the lungs or the abdomen. Uh, in any kind of way and just focuses here and that allows us that will actually allow this to stay really relaxed and then allow a student to pull in quite a bit of air in a short period of time um, of course 
students are encouraged to breathe in time, but um, I, I don't like the exercises that it's where you're just trying to fill up as much as possible um, over time that has been known to cause some physical problems, um, a cry, but chronic hyperventilation and things like that. So I, I don't encourage that kind of breathing exercise. I like just staying relaxed, having as natural a breath as possible. Some people have referred to it as a conversational breath, the type of breath that you take if you were just having a conversation with someone. So. To teach a basic trombone embouchure, I like to teach the student to say the syllable M, M, and then P. So you're keeping the, the M creates the corners, M, P, and the P separates the lips just slightly into like a football shape. M, P. Um, when teaching corners, I think it's always important to teach that it's really not the corners themselves. It's the muscles below the corners that are engaged. Um, I try to teach away from teaching the physical side of things with the younger students whenever possible and trying to just teach good habits. Um, but if you're in a position where you're needing to correct something or to teach um, using the musculature for some reason, again, it's the muscles below the corners. And with some, some students, I'll have them use their thumb and index finger just so they can feel what that might feel like. Um, it almost goes along where a goatee would go. So like right about here. If these muscles are engaged and pulling downward, then the muscles on the top typically will do the right thing, which is great. A mouthpiece placement typically um, should be about 60% above and 40% below to about 50-50. Although of course there are, you will see notable, notable exceptions. Um, Typically, we don't want a very low setting with the mouthpiece as a uh, majority of the vibration happens in the upper lip. And that would deny that free vibration of the upper lip and um, require that most of the vibration comes from the lower lip, which isn't ideal um, just because of the anatomy of the mouth. The pressure of the mouthpiece should be evenly distributed uh, across, if you think about four quadrants, you know, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. That regardless of where this is sitting vertically, if you're about 50 or 60, 40, that the mouthpiece sits pretty evenly on all four quadrants of the embouchure. Um, ideal for lateral situation is right in the middle, but really it's gonna depend on the student's teeth. Um, the dentature is actually the most important thing for the formation of an embouchure. So a majority of students I would say now or more than 50% of students get braces, so they're gonna have relatively st straight teeth. So most students you can teach right in the middle, although there are notable exceptions and people that play out, out at different angles. And um, again, that will mostly have to do with the, the shape of their teeth. Um, another good habit to encourage is a flat chin or chin that's kind of pointed downward. For me, a teaching tool is like a, a Pharaoh's you know, they have like the, the beard thing with ribbon wrapped around or whatever. So I teach that. That kind of gives you the shape and the direction that the chin needs to go for a good embouchure. Um, and I, I found that to be pretty helpful with young students. Of course, we want to avoid puffy cheeks. Um, I encourage students to keep their corners firm against the teeth or the cheeks against the teeth. Um, when we see puffing, which is common in young students, uh, there's a very physical reason for that. The physical reason is that the lips can only hold about 2 PSI. Uh, physically can hold, hold back about 2 PSI and we can blow about 15 to 18 pounds per square inch. So if a student is overblowing or blowing air that's too energetic or the lips are too tense in the front, the air needs to go somewhere. So staying relaxed here, good corners pulling down, will create a situation where air won't need to leak into these other places, whether it's above or below the lips or up into the cheeks. For buzzing on the trombone, I like to think of a kind of fuzzy, almost husky kind of sound in the buzz. Um, when you play the trombone, uh, and you were to, if you were to take the mouthpiece off, we're not gonna get a really buzzy zzz kind of sound. <laughs> There's actually a lot of air in the sound. If we were to go with a really buzzy sound, then you actually get a pretty bad sound on the trombone. 
So again, pretty airy, husky sound. I don't do a lot of buzzing personally. I don't teach a lot of buzzing, but I will use it as a way for a student to connect a sound in their head. If there's a difficult interval or difficult leap, I'll have them sing the interval and then buzz the interval. And then typically if they can sing and buzz it, they can play it. I know that there are people that advocate a lot more buzzing, um, but I found that one minute of buzzing is about the equivalent of an hour of practice. So if somebody's buzzing for about five minutes, that actually does a lot of work for the embouchure, um, for the trombone, and, and maybe a little bit too much for a lot of students, especially young students. But again, it is a way of connecting ear training. The thing that makes the trombone different from all other instruments is obviously the slide. It's a mystery to most people, including a lot of trombone players. Um, so the trombone has seven positions, but they're not equal distant. Um, it's a ratio. So the positions actually become a little bit longer the further you go out. And on adjusted partials, such as the sixth partial that sharp, when you go further out on the instrument, you need to adjust further and further and further. Um, this becomes even more important when the students have the valve and bass drum players, if they have two valves, the with two valves, you essentially have like four and a half positions instead of seven. So again, it's all ratios and different brands of trombone will have different lengths of slide. Um, there are two basic style of trombones, the Bach style trombone um, and a Con style trombone. And most trombone brands are based on these two styles. And a box slide will typically have a slightly wider slide and the con has a slightly more narrow slide and that affects the length of positions. Um, when teaching the trombone, most method books start in first position. A common first note to play is F in first position. And I, I think that's a little bit of a disservice, honestly, because that teaches first position as home and then everything is out in relation to that and everything becomes further and further. I actually think it's better to teach fourth position, which is right around where the uh, end of the slide here is, right around the bell. Again, that differs from instrument to instrument. But by teaching fourth position, then you have three positions above and three positions below. It actually acts as the center. If a student were to spend more time playing things originating around fourth position, like key of G and key of D, they typically learn the slide a lot faster than staying in B flat and F, which are based in first position, although many introductory or preparatory materials are based on those keys, and I understand that. Um, we talked previously already about a Spock type grip, and this grip, whether it's palm down or palm towards you, it needs to stay relaxed in the wrist. Um, students should not be using a lot of wrist majority of the motion should come from the elbow while the wrist acts as a shock absorber and the fingertips are also relaxed. Um, students should not grip the slide really firmly, that those should act um, really relaxed. If you know how to do the rubber pencil trick, that's about the appropriate amount of pressure to be putting on the slide. Most teachers will advocate maintaining contact with the slide grip at all times although many professionals actually will break contact with that. But for young students, I think it's helpful to keep contact at all times, but again, relaxed in the fingertips. When moving the trombone slide, if the wrist and fingertips are both relaxed, you'll be able to develop a slide technique that doesn't move the bell around. If the wrist is fixed or firm and the grip is too firm, then you'll have a problem of moving from the elbow and that's like a compass in math and that's that the arm becomes an arc. And when the arm is an arc, you'll pull the trombone around. Ultimately, we want the left side to stay fixed and for the slide to glide effortlessly along without jerking the horn around because that can move the mouthpiece on the face and cause you to miss notes. Due to the nature of the slide, trombonists often lag behind when developing intonation. Um, as mentioned previously, most beginning method books start with F as the first note. Unfortunately, the F is actually out of tune in first position. It's a little bit sharp. So the trombone players are, and actually all brass instruments in B flat are actually starting on an out of tune note. 
Um, the most common out of tune partials for the trombone and all brass instruments are the third, sixth, and seventh partials. Um, students need to be taught intonation tendencies as early as possible. Um, although beginning students won't be playing on the sixth and seventh partial for several years, um, as soon as they're introduced to those notes, they need to be taught the intonation tendencies for those notes so they can start to develop muscle memory. Um, constant reminders are also really helpful. One of the most important things for trombone players to develop good intonation, besides listening, is actually to keep their slide in good repair. If a slide's not working, you kind of end up with a sticky faucet syndrome where with a sticky faucet, if it's not working, you kind of jerk it really hard and maybe you go too far. So uh, if a slide's not working particularly well and you need to adjust by a centimeter, you might move it two inches and almost end up on a different note. Um, so keeping the slide working really well is really valuable. Many instruments, um, end up doing some intonation adjustments with the, the mouth or the embouchure. For the trombone, we shouldn't do that. We should only adjust intonation with the slide. Um, even if they're coming from baritone euphonium, that's an instrument that you can, because of the conical nature of that instrument versus the cylindrical here, you can actually move the intonation around quite a bit with your embouchure. For the trombone, we don't want to make that type of adjustment. We have a moving tuning slide, so we should make the adjustment entirely with our arm. Um, of course, intonation practice, it requires patience, it requires time. Um, but if teachers, when they're working with students one-on-one, -on -one, if, if they have that luxury, they can help students develop intonation early on. That's a very valuable thing. Um, there are a lot of great play-along resources now, or you can play along on the piano and play notes and have the student match that note and learn to hear what it sounds like to play really well in tune. Uh, and really, that's the only way. We teach visual locations, you know, I, the, on the top of the horn, the around the bell, the fingertips, um, but those vary so much from horn to horn and from individual to individual that really, it just depends. Um, the student needs to really be listening and, and make adjustments with their ear and learn how to tune with their hand from what they hear. Besides just having a slide, the biggest difference between the trombone and just about every other instrument is the way that we create legato. All brass instruments have the ability to slur. Typically, you would just blow air and, and move the valves. Um, and the trombone clearly doesn't have that ability. So if you were to move the slide, you create a gliss. When, if I were to do that, but move up a partial or to accelerate the air and slightly tense my lips, I would create a different note. I'd go from F to G. That sound, changing partials um, without using my tongue, is called a natural slur. Trombones need to integrate natural slurs and tongued legato in order to make a really good legato. If a student has a valve, blowing through a valve, that we call that a valve slur. <laughs> So valve slurs, natural slurs, tongued legato, and integrating those three and really trying to make them sound as similar as possible is the goal of the trombone player. I like to have my students practice a lot of scales so that they can really develop a good legato. Um, a criticism I would have of the Allstate system is that it typically asks for legato up or staccato down or vice versa. And I understand that, that a lot of that is for a time, but too many young students exclusively practice that way. So they, uh, trombone players will learn to slur up and not down or vice versa. Um, but they need to be able to do both. Um, play articulated up and down and legato up and down. Um, when working in, on this and developing this, I actually teach a lot of my students to slur and gliss through things so that they can hear where a natural slur would occur or a valve slur would occur and where a glissando would occur. Where the glissando occurs is where you would use the tongued legato. So an example of this, this is, will be a real simple scale, one octave B flat major. You'll hear the glissandi, and I'll go back and put in some legato tongue. And my goal is I'm gonna try to listen to my natural slur sound and the vowel slur sound and how, what that sounds like and try to make my legato tongue sound as similar as possible. There's a 
natural bump in the sound that occurs when you change partials. So I need to create a similar type sound with my tongue legato. For a lot of young students, that actually means that their legato tongue is much more firm than they, they did previously. We just don't want any glissando in the sound when we, when we do legato. Another common issue I see in young trombone players is that they just play short all of the time. I think that develops almost naturally because they're trying to avoid smears or glissandi in their playing. So if the slide technique is not developed early on, they'll typically play very short. So something I'm working with pretty much all college freshmen and again high school students that come and visit me for a lesson or to look at the University of Iowa is playing much more broadly. Professional trombonists play very broadly. Some in the New York Philharmonic and Chicago Symphony have called this a sostenuto style of playing. That doesn't mean that they lack clear fronts. They definitely have clear fronts or clear attacks, but they're playing much longer. A typical uh, articulation style from a young student that I'll hear sounds like tut, tut, tut. There's almost a tongue stop like you do in jazz at the end of each articulation. And if you were to say tut, 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 the tongue creates the articulation with a ta sound, tut, but then it returns to that same contact location early, effectively shortening the notes. You get that tut, tut, tut sound. As the tongue stays in the contact position for a long period of time, the student may feel like they're blowing through a phrase. They might feel like they're playing really consistently with their air but the tongue is damming up the air for a long time. So you might get some explosions in the sound. That, that really lacks of clarity or purity of sound. Um, by damming up the air for a long period of time and releasing the air, the lips blow apart. Changing where in the lips it vibrates and you get a burr in the sound or a, a crass sound. And then within a split second, the, the lips retract to where they were. If a student's playing really short, you're never able to get the resonance from the lips being in the correct spot. So you always have that burn the sound. Over time, that can actually change the embouchure to something that we won't, don't want and something that will give us a less pure sound. So if a student's having articulation issues, typically the answer is actually much more, um, much longer notes. Um, again, many times they'll feel like they are blowing through if you're teaching them to like blow through, make sure you're blowing through is a typical thing that we teach students. Um, but teach them to play as long as possible with a good front. I think that's a good phrase, as long as possible with a good front. Those notes all had a pretty consistent front. I, I played much longer, and I would still consider that in a band or orchestra to be an orchestral um, staccato. That would, st it sounded long, but it, it's not. Um, in the context of Orchestral music, this is Hungarian March, for example, by uh, Hector Berlioz, uh, one of them are most frequently asked for orchestral excerpts. I use that same tile, style of tonguing, really long notes with a good front, and you end up with staccato sounds. <laughs> for developing low range, there are a couple things that students can do that can help things along pretty quickly. We often teach students to open the jaw and to be more relaxed. Um, and it is true that that does occur naturally when you go into the lower range, but it's common for students to overcorrect pretty dramatically. Um, the second partial, low B flat, is actually uh, a, a challenging area for a lot of people, including graduate students. Um, and typically that's because, that is because they have played that partial uncentered for most of their lives. They can typically play a third partial F really well. And then they're taught to open their jaw and have slower, warm air. And so the sound is so unfocused and flat, um, and they learn to live within that, um, unfortunately. So the, the jaw does open slightly more to go down to that partial. But it's, it's tiny. It's, millimeters instead of a centimeter. Um, 
I find it better to actually have the student make sure that they can hear that pitch in their head. You can play it on the piano or a drone on your phone and, and just try to match that sound. And typically students will be much closer to the center of the pitch with a more vibrant resonant sound than if they were just to open up everything really wide. Um, as you go into low range, uh, again, things need to be firm, not loose. Um, there is a clear, definite location for everything in the low range. Um, students that are trying to play uh, the first partial of the pedal note, um, often it's just <laughs> versus Obviously, the pitch of the first one is extremely flat, and I hear that pretty frequently. A lot of audition repertoire um, for college level, entrance level solos or solo and ensemble level pieces, a lot of them have one or more pedal notes in it, and it's typical for that to miss by a half step or whole step even. Um, and that's because just everything is too open. Students need to play music down in this range. So play things down an octave, play familiar melodies, um, play them in all keys, um, and that, that can work on their ear training skills as well at the same time. As students progress and get older, they often will purchase or rent or borrow from the school a trombone with an F attachment. The F attachment allows students to be able to play some long positions like C or B natural in first and second position, and it also provides chromatic notes between E below the staff and pedal B flat on the first partial. Um, and that was why this key was chosen, is so that you could be fully chromatic um, between the E and the B flat. Unfortunately, most young students don't learn to play more than about three or four notes in the valve. Uh, when there are a lot of notes available to them, that could increase facility and um, limit the amount of back and forth you need to do with the slide, which will help us stay more relaxed. The first notes that students typically learn are C, and B natural, so they don't need to go to sixth and seventh position. And then they'll typically learn F and E, again, to avoid going to sixth and seventh positions. As they learn the other notes, um, a handy trick is to actually have them play in the middle octave and then pull the valve and find the same note, the inharmonic. So here's E flat. <laughs> my slide that is will be the location of the note in the lower octave so it ended up being about three and a half is the slide position about 3.5 or so 3.4 3.5 um, typically if you were to tell a student that E flat were in third position you might hear this which is about 30 or 40 cents sharp that works on every note on that position. Uh, sorry, every note in the valve. Um, as they go out the positions, they'll become longer and longer. But as students use their ear, again, matching the same note they just played open, D, D flat, C, down the slide, they'll be able to learn more quickly those low notes. Um, again, as with developing, this is part of developing low range, students just need to play music down there but the more they can learn, the better. Developing the high range, the most important thing is that students just play music up there. You can do exercises, you can do scales and arpeggios, which are, are essential and I absolutely teach to do that, but it's really essential that students just play music up there. So whether that's uh, repertoire in, in band or jazz band or orchestra that requires them to play up there, or solo repertoire that challenges them in the high range, or taking things up an octave. Um, they really just need time and experience doing it. While they're doing it, of course, we want to have good habits and good technique. So again, the corners remain firm. The lips need to stay relaxed. We don't actually tense up the lips. Um, the lips vibrate faster as a result of airspeed. The lips actually do, the aperture does become smaller, but I found that when you teach tighter lips that students actually will clamp down their lips vertically, pinching off the sound and not allowing air to travel through. And as we mentioned before, that can cause puffing of the cheeks or in the lips because the air needs to go somewhere. So we want the lips to remain relaxed, the corners to remain firm and have good fast air. 
Um, if you think about the embouchure like a donut, the outside of the ring of the donut, that should all remain relatively firm while the center of the donut stays relaxed, soft and supple so that it can vibrate freely as we blow air through the embouchure.